and a countdown. Three, two, one. Hi everyone. I'm just going to give people about 30 seconds to a minute to, to come in. I think it can take a little while for the room to fill up. Okay, so we seem to be sitting at about um, a final-ish number of participants, so I might get started then. Um, my name is Sarah Phillips. I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Government and International Relations in the School of Social and Political Sciences. And I teach into a number of degrees, but mainly the Masters of International Security and the Masters of International Relations, um, which is the one that I presume you're all here for. I have spent most of, I've been here for about 10 years, I've spent most of my career looking at conflict affected states. So most of my field work has been based in Yemen where I spent about four years or so, but I've also done a fair bit of work in Somaliland, in Kenya, in um, Iraq recently, Pakistan. So I like to try and I feel that field work is very important, not only to my research, but to my teaching. And that's something that I try to reflect in the classroom. And so hopefully you'll get a bit of a sense of that from the, from the little taster class that I'm going to, to give today. Um, if you would like to ask me a question as we go, it's a bit hard to monitor the chat while I'm doing this, but if you'd like to, if you're able to unmute yourself and ask a question, I'm, I'm very happy for you to just call in a question as we're going. That's absolutely no problem at all. So what I think I will try to do is just give you a, a sense of the sort of class that you might experience if you, if you go ahead with this degree. Um, and also to just give you a sense maybe of some of the students that we've had previously come through. One of the great pleasures that I have as a lecturer within this unit um, is seeing my students go on to develop their careers and maintaining personal connections and friendships with them. Uh, when I was in Iraq, just before the lockdown happened. I was there um, with one of my former students who is now working as a security analyst in Baghdad who was able to help me to facilitate this research trip. Um, we do try to keep in touch with our, our students wherever possible because it's, it really is gratifying for us to see people go on and have these really um, interesting careers. So some of my former students have gone on to work in the UN, in humanitarian agencies, there's been a lot of journalists, risk analysts, people in um, resource companies, um, academics, of course, some of my students have come along to be colleagues of mine now. And there's also some in um, very high level advisory positions. It's a really diverse group that we, that we have come through our degrees. And what the degree gives you is an understanding of some of the world's really most pressing challenges, I think. We look at issues like war and peace, like social and economic justice, poverty, development, environmental sustainability. We look at things like how states interact with non-state actors. We talk about the evolution of the international system. The aim of the degree is to help you to develop really sophisticated, critical thinking. Um, and we do this through intellectually rigorous and a research intensive program. Everyone has the option to do, well, you have to do a capstone unit, 
And two of the options for that capstone unit is to do a 5,000 word research essay, or you can do a 10,000 word research essay, where you, both of which you'll have supervisors and you have the opportunity to really um, bounce around your ideas with an expert in your field. We've also got uh, the, one of the largest international relations departments in the country, and we've got links to a number of different think tanks in Australia, like the Australian Institute of International Affairs, where quite a number of our students um, have been interns and have gone on to make presentations there, and also the Lowy Institute. Um, so our main aim, as I said, is to, to help you to get a deep understanding of a complex world and how to solve complex problems within it. So today I've been asked to give you like a, a, a truncated version, if you like, of a class that you will actually have from within this degree. So the one that I'm going to deliver to you today is from um, one called Fragile States in, um, and Intervention. And it's a core unit within our Masters of International Security degree, but you can do it from within international relations as well. And so this unit looks at the apparent changes to the nature of organized collective violence after the end of the Cold War. And this called end of history, which any of you who've studied international relations at all in your, uh, in your undergraduate degree will have heard of this, this famous triumphant article by Francis Fukuyama at the end of the Cold War, where he essentially proclaims all of the main ideological divisions in the world are now gone. And, we're, we're entering in a far more peaceful period of our history. Of course, this was very, very quickly upended uh, and shown to be uh, wishful thinking. We also look at the division between traditional modes of thinking about security, which is very much about state actors taking on other state actors, to the rise of human security uh, and thinking about what we call the security reference as being individuals, individual human beings, or also communities, or even the planet. Um, we look at things like the rise of the responsibility to protect, uh, which is this idea that it is not only ideal for nations around the world to come to the assistance of people who are in immediate um, uh, danger of dire violations of their basic human rights, but that it's become a, a responsibility and that is part of the sovereign responsibility is to protect civilians from harm. So what this unit that I'm that I'm talking from today really tries to unravel is the nature of what these things called fragile states are and why it is that they experience such a disproportionate level of international intervention. More importantly though, it's about understanding what constitutes a so-called fragile state and why these things are actually really, really important to understanding the global power hierarchies that help to reproduce poverty and insecurity throughout the world. So uh, one of the, the real fundamental premises of this unit is that to understand contemporary international security and contemporary international development practices and discourses, it's really helpful to understand how and why a special category of state, which is the fragile state, has been constructed and upheld. Essentially part of what we explore throughout this unit is the possibility that the label of fragility is one that Western states have tended to apply to those states that they see as being in need of some sort of remedial act or intervention by Western states. So rather than the label applying to some essential characteristic of the state in question, I want us to explore the possibility that it may in fact be more of a reflection of the actions that external actors wish to take. That's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves for the moment. Let's, let's oops, send my computer flying. Let's look for a second at, at what fragile states are. So fragile states are, we're told that they're dangerous. Um, they're not only dangerous to the well-being of their own citizens, but they're dangerous to the security of the world at large. Fragile states, the conventional wisdom goes, are places where violence, poverty, disease are all really prevalent and where the state lacks the basic will or capacity, or both, to contain them. 
So fragile states have become framed as objects to try to fix and most almost invariably experience some form of external intervention, whether it's through peacekeeping or stabilization operations, humanitarian interventions, uh, military occupation, state building projects, international development assistance or aid as it's usually called. And this is because security threats are rarely, if ever, um, neatly contained by national borders. This was kind of the old thinking about security that, that I referred to before, traditional thinking about security, that the state is the fundamental actor that needs to act in the interest of the security of its citizens. But we really come to see with the era of, of increasing globalization that this, this really doesn't work. And that is being obviously illustrated by the pandemic that we're all living through at the moment. You know, the ease with which disease, but also terrorism, crime, fiscal meltdowns and war all transcend national borders with a rapidity and an ease that has given rise to this idea that the lack of development is a security threat and the lack of development or underdevelopment is not only a security threat to the lives and livelihoods of the populations that live with it, but also to the world at large. So here we come to this idea that security and development are mutually productive, right? To create a more secure world, poor countries need to be given the chance to develop. But equally, you can't develop without there being at least a basic level of security. So this is referred to often as the security development nexus, you know, this idea that you cannot have development without security and you cannot have security without development. Now, Kofi Annan, who was, uh, he is a former head of the United Nations or former general, uh, secretary general, um, he put this point quite succinctly back in 2004, and he's been, this is a widely quoted definition of the security development nexus, and I think it's helpful for us to, to, to think about where this idea of state fragility has come from. So he said, development and security are inextricably linked. A more secure world is only possible if poor countries are given a real chance to develop. Extreme poverty and infectious diseases threaten many people directly, but they also provide a fertile breeding ground for other threats, including civil conflicts. Even people in rich countries will be more secure if their governments help poor countries to defeat poverty and disease by meeting the Millennium Development Goals. So this truism became known, as I said, as the security development nexus. And it frames the idea that having a lack of development is not only dangerous for the citizens of the developing state, but for the world at large. So since, particularly since 2001, we've then seen the goals of international interventions being explained as to bring about development. So you might remember, although I'm going to take a wild guess, that most of you were probably very young to not born in 2001 um, when the attacks uh, on the United States uh, occurred. But very quickly, this um, the, the focus went to Afghanistan and the idea was that you, know, you needed to remove the Taliban because they were providing safe space or safe refuge, safe harbour for Al-Qaeda. So you had to get rid of them in order to provide a security dividend or a security benefit for America, the rest, the, uh, the West and the rest of the world. So the, the argument went. But it was also framed in terms of being to bring about development. The two were seen as being mutually reproductive, or at least they were framed in that way. So it wasn't just about removing the regime of the Taliban, but it was also about allowing women's rights to expand and to, to flourish and to remove a draconian regime for, that was brutalizing its population so that basic development could be enabled to, to expand. So this, in the policy discourses, you know, that were, were, that were pushing the, um, the war machine were inherently linked together. And the same thing happened even more explicitly, I would say, with Iraq in 2000 and the lead up sort of 2002, 2003 when it actually took place. So you might remember there was this big debate over whether or not Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, which was the initial rationale behind going to war in Iraq that was offered. But when that was really thoroughly publicly debunked, 
the discourse changed and it was about bringing about democracy. It was about bringing about development. It was about freeing people from the brutal dictatorship of someone like Saddam Hussein and his, his Ba'ath party. But the two were always very much wrapped together in the way that this policy framework was promoted to the people who needed to buy into it. Security and development were seen as being mutually constructive and also inseparable. So today what I want to do just briefly is to consider how these sorts of interventions of which Afghanistan and Iraq have been the most long-standing, the most controversial, the most expensive in, in any sort of metric that you look at, but which are really common. I want us to consider how these sorts of interventions look to people who live in these so-called fragile states. Um, and I want to explore you know, briefly some of the ways that these interventions are often seen by local populations to perpetuate the very threats that they are claiming to diminish. So in doing that, what we're really doing is we're trying to look at world politics from the perspective of less powerful people, from the perspective of less powerful actors to see what this might be able to reveal about some of the most familiar narratives that we have within international relations, which is by its history, a very conservative and Eurocentric discipline. So let's think through then what some of these familiar narratives are before we go a little deeper and look at what breaking down the concept of state fragility can help us to see about some of these familiar narratives. So I'm just going to list a few of them and then we can return to them or you can, you can ask questions about them later as, as you wish. I think one of the most familiar narratives, and this is the one that is held up particularly by the realist school, I'm not going to get into that um, at, at the moment, but for those of you who do have a background in, in IR, this will be familiar to you. And that is that the state is still the central actor within world politics. There are multilateral organizations, there are civil society actors, there are non-state agencies that matter, but fundamentally the state is still the central actor. That's one familiar narrative. Another, my favorite, uh, which I can talk about later, why that is my favorite, um, that the state is still almost invariably defined as the set of institutions that claims, or at least tries to claim, at least seeks to claim, makes a presumptive claim to having a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. This narrative is basically ubiquitous throughout the discipline of international relations. Any state that does not hold a monopoly on the legitimate use of force is almost invariably framed as being a diminished form of state, a failed state, a fragile state, the kind of state that we're looking at here. And the, how the government or the state institutions within um, that territory are almost invariably again framed as wanting that legitimate uh, monopoly on the legitimate use of force. If you don't have it, you want it. There's, it's kind of set up as this binary dualistic um, relationship. Another one is that we can meaningfully, this one's a little more controversial, but that we can meaningfully measure grades of stateness, you know, that it, that it exists along a spectrum, but at one end, it's pretty unambiguous that you've got a collapsed or a failed state. And then, you know, you go through these various spectrums of gray. And at the other end, you've got, you know, a really, you've got Scandinavia, basically. You, you've got the very successful states that have legitimate institutions that are accepted by uh, the vast, vast majority of the population. The idea that underlies this belief about the possibility to grade or somewhat measure or rank states is that we can do so by looking at their internal capacities, particularly their, the ability of these states to provide security and other basic services. But that we can do this without considering where these internal capacities came from historically and without explicit reference to the global hierarchies of power and wealth that help to maintain them. So let's put this onto a map for a second. So who, what counts as a fragile state, but also who's counting? Like, what are we talking about when I, when I go on about this category of diminished state, the fragile state? In 2017, uh, the Fragile States Index put out one of these maps. This is actually a little bit more up to date. This is the one from 2019, but 
these these numbers that I'm going to give you do not change much from year to year. So it, it's no problem that, that I'm actually giving you the exact figures from 2017 because I can guarantee you that they're basically the same now. But they said that on this map, um, 124 of the 178 countries that they measured, they deemed to be at a warning level or higher. Now, if we go and consider the incredible diversity of those 124 countries, it's not very surprising that we've got a fairly large literature that goes to critique general terms like fragile, failing, failed, um, which is trying to suggest that all of these states share some sort of fundamental defect along this spectrum of dysfunction. Most of the dysfunction is most acutely surrounding the so you know the failure to uphold a monopoly on the legitimate use of force if you want to be categorized by you know most academics or policy thinkers who buy into this language as being a failed state they are the ones that do not have any semblance of a monopoly on the legitimate use of force so somalia is usually the one that is that is held up there Despite this though, like despite the level of um, critique that this term does tend to bring up from academics, the term fragile statehood is really, really integral to mainstream security and policy doctrine throughout the global north or, or Western states as is sometimes provided. The two are kind of interchangeable. And they're used to provide like a lens through which we can understand the drivers of violence, the drivers of poverty across the global south. This is how they are understood by the major development agencies, think tanks, university research centers, the UN, multilateral organizations like the UN, the World Bank, um, the Asian Development Bank, you know, I, I could go on. Every year you've got these international organizations that monitor, measure, rank and compare the political, economic and social characteristics that supposedly define states as fragile and as such, render them as being in need of some sort of remedial reaction uh, action. Remember, if we go back to the, the quote that I read you by Kofi Annan, he is explicitly saying that being in, you know, having um, development deficiencies is a security threat to the population in question and to the world at large. And it is incumbent upon the rest of the world, the wealthy states, as he puts it, to provide assistance to help them move out of this. You may note though that his language there was quite, um, it, it very much presumes not only a benevolent outside actor who is doing this, but one that is very, very capable, like very good at socially engineering outcomes such that there are no unintended consequences or that the unintended consequences can be managed and that the outcomes will be you know, gradually leading towards something better. Australia's foreign affairs and trade or DFAT, which was back, back in the day, uh, OSAID, it put the case quite plainly in 2005. And it said that fragile states, and this is a quote, have little chance of overcoming serious problems alone. In fact, if left unassisted, they may experience fragility and development stagnation for generations. Okay, so they're, they're saying that, that, that poorer countries cannot do this alone. They need help from the outside. Now, if we we're all sitting in the classroom together, I would open up a discussion here. This is a bit of a one-way forum, unfortunately. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease out from this what I think is important, but keep in mind that if we were in a classroom, we'd talk about this. Um, but to me, this really is suggestive of the problem that is being portrayed for these fragile states coming from within the fragile state itself, right? It is not a product of, let's say, the historical legacies of colonialism or the ongoing impact of neocolonialism or the way that the global economy has been structured to favor those who are already wealthy or those who are colonial powers. I could go on. It's very much about looking at the problems that affect this country in a very narrow domestic through a very narrow domestic lens but not looking at the much larger global context that has helped to account for the historical trajectory that has brought the state to where it is or the things within those power hierarchies that help to keep the state in that place this is a very common sort of statement to hear come out of a development agency though. Britain's Department for International Development 
um, which has also recently been disbanded and absorbed into the Foreign Office. Um, it made a fairly seminal claim like five years later and it said that eliminating global poverty and achieving the Millennium Development Goals will not be possible unless the international community tackles conflict and the fragility more effectively. So they've got a whole fragility department. Um, so does, so does Alzado, so does, um, or had, DFAT had it, I'm not sure if they still do, to be honest. Um, but the idea was to investigate the drivers of fragility and conflict that exist within the states in question, okay? But the point that I want you to take away from this is that if we flip this around and actually talk to the people who are in these states that are being labeled as fragile, they regularly challenge the idea that external assistance is inherently useful, or at least external assistance in the way that is being contrived in the typical state building, peacekeeping, official development assistance programs, that these things are inherently useful to them. Most members of the African Union, the 38 states that were initially listed as being fragile by the OECD way back in 2006, and Papua New Guinea have all categorically rejected the term fragility. They see it as being pejorative and see it as having permutations on imperial, of imperialism and an encroachment on their sovereignty. The president of Burundi gave an address to the United Nations General Assembly in 2009, and he was quite strident on this. He said, I'll read you the quote again. Um, the, terminology, the terminology fragile states should only be used with caution. I feel that it is not neutral terminology. Apart from the emotional implications, it has financial and political implications. I'm interjecting here, this is me speaking. The way that um, lending agencies, credit ranking agencies understand or um, attribute um, the level of risk with, uh, with lending money to these countries comes largely from these indexes that measure statehood. So if you are measured to be or assigned the label of fragility, that's got huge implications for your ability to borrow money um, from the global market. It also has huge implications for your ability to attract development aid. Once you have been deemed fragile by the World Bank, it opens up a swathe of new funding that is not available to states that are not measured as being uh, or not deemed as being fragile. So there's lots of economic and political implications that are attached to this. If we want to further go down this, um, you know, this, this line of thinking and think more about the historical amnesia that gets embedded in the term of fragility, we could also think of the fact that the vast majority of states that you can still see on their map there um, were states that experienced uh, European colonialism. They're also the tended to be the sites of Cold War proxy conflicts between the United States and the USSR. Um, if we look, for example, on the OECDs, which is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, they put out a list of, um, they call it the harmonized list of fragile situations. But anyway, there's lots of really boring jargon in this field. I'm trying to skip through as much of it as I can to get you to what I think is most juicy and most helpful for us to understand the structure of the international system from outside of its Eurocentric core. So this list that they put out, they put different ones out each year. I'm just using the, the 2015 one because it, it, it's indicative in certain ways. Um, it had 50 countries on it, right? And almost all of them, um, except for those that were outside of Europe, so it included um, Kosovo and Bos Bosnia and Her Herzegovina. Outside of those, all of them, almost all of them, experienced European colonial rule. There was three partial exceptions. One of them was Ethiopia. Ethiopia was occupied by Italy for five years, but it wasn't formally colonized. Another is Nepal, which was a British protectorate, but also wasn't formally colonized. And another was North Korea, which was colonized by Japan, but not by a European power. By the OECD's publication in 2018, there was only 36 states that included. Every single one of them had been colonized by a European state. Now to me and to many of the people in the states that are being so labeled, this is a pretty striking correlation to leave unremarked. And it does beg the question if there could be more of a causal story here in the history of plunder that, and violence that they experienced. 
But what the fragile states narrative really does and the policies that enact that fragile states narrative, they keep the discussion to domestic politics. They keep the discussion to domestic economics. This is about local corruption. Um, okay, so if we come back then to what this course is, is fundamentally trying to, to get across, it's, it's really a course about trying to understand alternative narratives about conflict and insecurity and poverty to those that might seem most intuitive from within what I referred to before as the historically Eurocentric discipline of international relations. It's also to pose the, the question of the degree to which the states that you study throughout your, your time in this degree may not really be the outliers to the global system in the way that the term fragile implies. And I want you to ponder the fact that these states might actually offer some really deep insights into many of the widening chasms in global politics to the extent that they may be even out there leading the way. Like, these states tend to feel the early impact of global forces so that they, they might actually foreshadow much of the experiences that, that, those, that we in wealthy northern states may, may see. Okay, I want to show some pictures now because um, I've talked for a while. This is a photo that I that I took from a from a development. It was a like a monitoring um, report that I found to be of unusual color. And what it was doing was it was monitoring some of the um, USAID, that is the U.S. Uh, United States uh, Agency for International Development. It was looking at its stabilization programs on coastal Kenya. So these were programs that were being rolled out, particularly in response to the fact that a Shabab. The, the Somali um, insurgent, terrorist, violent extremist, whatever you want to call it, movement was gaining ground and was gaining ground in, in coastal Kenya, where there was already a separatist movement of largely but not entirely ethnic Somalis. Um, and the underlying theory to this was essentially the security development nexus, that because the parts of coastal Kenya that were experiencing this sort of separatist movement were tended to be poor and underdeveloped that helping the government the the u.s government the or its international development agency helping the kenyan government to provide development um, along the coast was going to help to bolster the government against um against the growth of a group like shabab now again were we in a classroom situation we would have a discussion about this which is by far how i prefer to do this because there's a lot of different interpretations that you could quite reasonably take from these photographs. They might be a little bit hard to see, but basically what you've got on the left is a latrine. Uh, and on the right, you've got a photograph that's been taken from inside and just above the door, someone has written the word Al Qaeda. Now the question that gets raised is, by, and by the authors of this quite, quite colorful um, and well-researched report, um, is why would someone write this on, a toilet that has just been repaired by USAID in coastal Kenya. I've just seen questions coming up. Um, I'm going to, I can't read them and, and answer them while we're going. If you, if you are able to take yourself off mute, you're more than welcome to, um, to, to call out or we can wait until, until we're after, after we're done, but I can't, my computer screen is too small to manage lots of little different pop-up windows, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so, why would this appear? Why would someone write the word Al-Qaeda? Now, the idea is that there is um, an external threat emanating from coastal Kenya. This is the idea that the USAID is really operating under, okay? That this threat in the form of a Shabab um, or other forms of militancy against either its, uh, its allies in the Kenyan government or more broadly, um, is due basically to a lack of development on the coast. So if you can fix the development issues here, build latrines, you can remove the grievance and then you can get the security. Okay, this is a, this is a dulled down version of, of, of the logic, but I think you, you see what I'm saying with it. Um, the authors of this report cite 
what they refer to as one incredulous religious leader in Garissa. And he apparently asked, why would the most powerful country in the world come all the way here to repair, not even build a public latrine? Do they think we're stupid? People were even more incredulous that the ded dedication of this particular refurbished latrine were required the presence of the US general from Djibouti, which is a neighboring country, and the US ambassador from Nairobi, which incurred a huge cost, and also meant that the roads around Garissa had to be closed for security reasons. And again, the, the report says that the real objectives of the US president, uh, presence in coastal Kenya are non-humanitarian. This is self-evident even to school children who had graffitied Al-Qaeda in one of the school latrines built by the, the USAID team. So the, in, the interpretation that we can see being reflected in this bit of graffiti, and I love using graffiti as a, as a means of doing um, social analysis. I find it fascinating. Um, but you know, the one interpretation that I think is quite reasonable to take from this is that people are not seeing USAID as having um, as being driven by humanitarian intentions. And there's a strong level of skepticism about what the US's intentions regarding poverty reduction really are. You've got to ask the question then, what does this do? What does this belief do that humanitarian intentions are not sincere? What does that do to traditional economic development programs? When you start to, and this is sort of the, the pointy end of what happens when you really start to entwine security logics with development logic, something that on the face of it can seem so common sense that, yeah, of course you can't have security if you can't even provide an environment where kids can go to school or where you can get even you know, basic healthcare. That makes sense. But on the other, when you start to entwine these two logics, you start to open up all a whole can of worms. There was a leaked document from the British Department of International Development, which said, this is from 2009, 2010, I can't recall, but it said that um, a new, there was a new National Security Council, which oversees now all aspects of foreign policy, and it requires that national con security considerations are placed at the heart of aid projects. So from there, you can probably see where this is going. The, the National Security Council is deeming, and this is not just in, in the UK, this is just where it was leaked, but the US is very explicit about this at times as well, that the idea that official development assistance should make the maximum possible contribution to national security. Okay, so there is a need now for many development programs to have to make the case for how their work in development contributes somehow to national security. And we saw this uh, in Yemen a lot, which is where I've done the most, the vast majority of my research. In 2010, the USAID strategy for Yemen was really explicit and it said that, quote, USAID projects must collaborate closely with the Department of Defense where possible. So here's where we see the pointy end of the security development nexus, that humanitarian agencies may be strongly encouraged, if not required, to place security and military considerations at the heart of their actions. And this raises the question of what becomes of international development when it gets securitized. I'm gonna show you a picture that um, one of my PhD students brought to my attention. Um, and, and he likes to, he wrote about the security development nexus in, in Pakistan. And he asks the question, you know, are, what, is, what are these sorts of interventions doing? Are they securing development? You know, are they providing the atmosphere or the, the level and the modicum of security that is necessary in order for at least the most basic level of development to occur. You could ask though if the woman here might actually feel more secure because of the US presence. That is certainly a hotly debated uh, question. Now here's another question that might cause us to think about this differently. Now, again, if we were, if we were in, to go back to my mantra, if we were in a classroom situation, this would be a bit different and I would have a, a conversation. I would ask you, do you recognize this person? And I would expect that one to zero people would probably recognize this person. So if you do, congratulations. This person is Shaquille Afridi. Okay. Shaquille Afridi was sentenced to 33 years in prison. Um, 
In response, the United States cut its aid to Pakistan by $33 million. In there. So it's a direct response to this man's imprisonment. Now, the reason that Shaquille Afridi is so famous is you may have heard, I would wager that you probably have heard about the way that Osama bin Laden was killed. And he was killed by the, the team of uh, US um, special forces who went in um, and found him ha hiding in Pakistan. It's part of the, the most important way that they were able to confirm where Osama bin Laden was hiding for all of those years in Pakistan was by collecting DNA samples from the surrounding, from the village and, and its surrounds to confirm whether or not bin Laden's children were living in that area. How did they access the DNA? Through a polio vaccination campaign. So the CIA, knowingly or unknowingly to Shaquille Afridi, Dr. Shaquille Afridi, he claims he did not know the Pakistani government says he absolutely knew and was working hand in glove with the CIA to do this but they collected DNA samples by providing polio vaccinations to children and in so doing collecting DNA samples to confirm that there was indeed a match to Osama bin Laden. After this, the number of polio vaccination workers and other vaccination workers um, who were murdered in Pakistan went through the roof. It gave legs, it gave oxygen, it gave, um, uh, gave justification to this long-standing narrative that the CIA, that this was all a CIA program to collect DNA or to do whatever. Like this had always been a rumor and this program basically proved it true or proved, it made it seem justifiable. You had a terrible blurring of security concerns with the development goals. Like was the doctor and his team providing development to the community or was he providing security to the United States? So in other words, we get the security development nexus. Um, it, it poses this question very sharply and it poses it most sharply with regard to um, so-called fragile states because it problematizes development. It makes development in these states that we label as fragile as being something that must be so urgently, urgently solved. Um, I have other examples that I've, I'm realizing that time is ticking on. I would like to give you guys plenty of opportunity to, to ask questions. But one of the other things that I like to really come back to over and over again in, in this unit is to the sorts of metadata that we as Western trained social scientists are often taught to disregard as being you know, perhaps conspiratorial. So, I mean, the, the long-standing theory within Pakistan and many other places, including, you know, it's rampant in, in the Western countries now as well, that vaccinations are dangerous because something nefarious is going on with them. This was something that we were always taught to disregard before it really gained global prominence as a, as a theory. But actually, something really important was going on there um, that if we didn't pay attention to it, we missed. I write about this sort of thing a lot with regard to how Yemenis understand Al-Qaeda, okay? And Yemenis understand Al-Qaeda, well, Iraqis understand ISIS, Pakistanis often understand the Pakistani Taliban, I could go on, um, but as being something more than an autonomous terrorist network. It is also, it may be an autonomous, it may be partly autonomous terrorist network, but it is also this nefarious, shadowy, opaque, arm of the state or of certain state actors. Now, I find that when I talk to policymakers or in the media or whatever about these theories, it's almost in, in, invariably like laughed off as just being this ridiculous conspiracy theory. I actually pr probably get treated with a lot more respect when I talk about this than my Yemeni colleagues do. They tend to just be written off as being just ridiculously conspiratorial and irrational. The point is, and we talk about this in a lot more detail in throughout the unit. My point is that the impulse to write these sorts of things off as biased or conspiratorial often reveals a lot more about the person writing it off than it does about the speaker because it is within these sorts of noise that we actually hear multiple forms of resistance to 
security interventions to the labels of fragility that we apply to states that deviate from norms that we have constructed. It's within this noise that I think we might also really start to understand why so-called fragile states so often fail to, or why, these, why the interventions in these so-called fragile states so often to fail to achieve their stated objectives. And it's also within this noise that we may understand why this general failure isn't just a symptom of the domestic dysfunction of the states in question. So what I'm saying and what I finish with saying and then we'll open up for questions is, I think that we've got to take very seriously the way in which interventions are seen, understood and talked about by those who experience them and not just through the network of the usual elite suspects who speak fluent English who've been to Western universities. But I think we need to get a lot more better, uh, a lot more better, oh dear, it's late in the day. We need to get a lot better at, um, at incorporating the local understandings of conflict, of, of poverty and exclusion into the way that we understand global development processes. I'll finish there and open it up for questions if anybody would like to ask something. I can go to one that I received earlier, which was Paul's question. Why do you think that ever since the end of the Cold War, Western Europe and the United States think they have arrived at the end of history? How do, I, how do you think that waking, the waking up of China and India will influence the foreign interventions in the future? <laughs> um, short answer, I don't know. Um, why does the US and, um, like to think, I mean, everybody likes to think that they're living in the most important moment of history, don't they? I think that's the way that the human, human psychology is wired. Um, we've all never lived through a moment as incredible as the present. I think that is, that is just part of how we understand uh, the human condition. Uh, how, yeah, the India-China thing, I'm probably not the best person to, um, to answer that. That's not really... Um, related to, to my own areas of research. But if anyone's got any questions about, you know, whether you want to talk about the degree or any questions about what we've discussed, how much intervention can I study in this degree? Uh, how do you mean? Can you explain that question a little more? Do you mean, can you study different forms of intervention? Ah, okay. Anonymous, thanks a lot for the lecture. Could you explain a bit more about why the fragile states tend to feel the early impact of global forces? That is a great question. It's something that I am thinking about um, a lot at the moment, why it is. I think part of it is that they are less protected. Uh, they don't have global legal regimes that are designed to protect them from the predations of more powerful states. So you tend to see these things happening um, much more acutely. They are much more likely to be intervened upon by their neighbors without it, um, or by you know, more powerful countries without it provoking um, international outrage. Um, but I do think as well that we, I think it's partly how we look at them. We tend not to see corruption in our own countries because we're more familiar with what it looks like and it just seems normal to us. We are conditioned to see, um, you know, the way that banking regulations work or the way that, um, I mean, the, the classic example is uh, the City of London, the way the City of London actually uh, launders about 50% apparently of the world's illicit money. We just don't tend to see those things when they're happening around us. But when you when you look elsewhere, when things are less familiar, um, they, they tend to look, um, they can look more dangerous. An example that I often give to that is, um, and, and this works better for an American audience than to an Australian one, but the idea of gun violence, like for someone outside of the American context, the level of, like if you had that level of gun violence in 
you know, Yemen or in uh, Somalia, that would be charted up as being you know, something that is you know, very much an indicator of a fra of fragile statehood. But when you live with it, you become used to it. You know, you understand the rules around it or the norms or, you know, you, you become somewhat, I mean, used to it, really. Um, and so I think it's also partly a matter of perspective about what you are used to seeing and what you are used to accepting and uh, uh, as opposed to what you are not. So I think that perhaps part of the answer is that we, um, we, we tend to look at um, places in the global south with a different lens to that that we apply to our own. Uh, next question, uh, in this degree, can I focus on interventions solely? Uh, no, there's, no, there's, the, 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 the degree isn't structured in that way. Um, there's, uh, there's four different core units that you take. And then depending on what your prior learning is, what your recognition of prior learning is, that will depend, uh, that will influence how many units you need to take, but it's usually a total of between eight and 16. And then you can pick from, you know, from a list. So you can, you can certainly craft your degree to have more of a focus on, uh, on interventions. I teach another unit um, called Conflict and Security in the Middle East, where we really look at that issue as well, but from a, from a different perspective. So there's certainly a number of units that you can, you can select if that's your primary interest, but there's not a, um, I wouldn't say that it's, a, it's not a sub-discipline or anything like that. And I think I might take the next question. We have a question about the Bachelor of Laws uh, degree being advocate to pursue the Master of International Relations. So yes, if you have a Bachelor of Laws uh, with a average of 65 WAM throughout your whole degree, uh, we encourage you to apply. I think genuinely having a humanities background uh, will benefit you when you're pursuing Master of International Relations. I mean, Sarah, what, what was your background? Did you also study a Bachelor of um, Arts or any other degree? I did a Bachelor of Arts with an honours degree in history. Yeah, so any, any degree that is in humanities, and even if it's not, uh, we'll still consider it on a case-by-case -case basis, but in this specific scenario, yeah, Bachelor of Laws is good. Mm. And our next, next question is um, analyzing certain regions in the world, like the Middle East. So whether students in the Master of International Relations are able to focus on the Middle East or other regions throughout their units of study. Um, I believe that um, Sarah will be able to answer it well. Yeah, most, I, th I would say the biggest area of specialization within the department is in Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, I'm the main person who focuses on places like the Middle East and Africa. Um, but yeah, you can certainly, you can certainly tailor um, your, your study to your interests. And there are units that, um, that, that deal particularly with the Middle East, the one that I've referred to before. Thank you. And uh, we have a few more questions to go through um, in seven minutes. So <laughs> listen through your questions. And if, we, um, if you don't answer them in time, you can always get in touch with us. But next one is a, from a student from Singapore. They're wondering about any departmental links uh, to foreign affairs departments in Singapore and Southeast Asia, as well as what the jobs are like uh, for a Master of International Relations graduates and what kind of fields or roles should they be expecting to enter once they graduate? Uh, well, like I said, the, some of the, our graduates typically go on to pursue careers in government in, or in other sorts of policy related fields in journalism, in security, in NGOs, in the UN, in development. Like it's, it's quite diverse, um, but a lot, well, probably the most common um, career aspiration would be some sort of, foreign affairs or public bureaucracy. As for links to foreign affairs departments in Singapore or Southeast Asia, uh, not that I, not formally that I know of, but some of the academics who focus on those areas uh, may have uh, less formal links. Perfect, and I've just sent you through the list of our international partners as well. So whether you're looking at um, doing an internship um, or going an exchange in a degree, 
make sure you have a look. And our next question is about the strengths of this program compared to other universities. Uh, I mean, Sarah, you, you probably are not aware or I'm not really sure if you can answer this question. I mean, I can say that studying humanities at Sydney is amazing. We are the strongest humanities faculty in the state, at least. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're one of the biggest departments in the Southern Hemisphere, really. Um, so you, you, get that, you, you get that breadth and depth, not only from within the department, but we've also really opened up so that you can, um, you can choose units from outside of our department as well. And we've got a really strong offering across the entire School of Social and Political Sciences um, and across the faculty. You can also take units from outside as well. So some people will study languages, or some people will, um, will, will study units from, from outside. So you are studying at the University of Sydney also opens you up to other, the other units outside of the department that you have. And because Sydney Uni is one of the biggest in the country and the, the Southern Hemisphere, you've just got such a diversity of units and expertise that are available to you. Perfect. And our next question is, on what are the specific methods of international intervention in general, Sarah? Uh, look, like I said, there's, there's heaps of them, but I um, mean, the more explicit ones are, well, aid, um, official development assistance, um, humanitarian intervention, peacekeeping, um, state building. Um, they're, they're probably the, oh, of course, you know, security military occupation or you know, drone programs, all these sorts of things are some of the more obvious, but then there's also things like structural adjustment programs, which we tend not to talk to talk about quite so much within the security side of the discipline, but which actually are extremely important for setting the, um, setting the conditions under which military dictatorships tend to be able to gain and retain power um, or and the, the inequalities that we then come to see as defining the state as fragile and requiring further intervention. Perfect. And one more question with four minutes to go. Uh, we have a student who is in the mid-level uh, of their career that is unrelated to international relations. Uh, they want to know about, I guess, the job and career prospects completing this degree and what are the opportunities possible in the field. I mean, I can, I can get started with, um, you know, some of our graduates are ending up in very diverse fields. You don't have to become a diplomat if you're studying international relations, uh, but in particular to the degree, Sarah, if you would like to add. Look, if you, want, if you want a career where you need to be able to analyze what's going on in the world with a bit of zest and a bit of flair and a bit of um, critical acumen, it's a great degree to do. Like if you like reading the newspaper and trying to sort of, you know, burrow down in the, into the details of what's going on and would like to work in a job, whether that is journalism or humanitarianism or an NGO or the UN or... Um, security or risk analysis or whatever, this is the sort of degree that can help you to gain those critical skills that will help you to peel back the fairly opaque layers covering you know, the, the international system. This gives you the skills of critical analysis. This, this teaches you where to look if you want to understand the drivers of global inequality or poverty, insecurity, all these sorts of things that are useful in so many different possible kinds of careers, you will get the sorts of critical analytical skills to delve into that doing this degree. I think that was a great answer. And we have two minutes to go. And Sarah, if you have any last piece of advice for uh, any students that are here and thinking of pursuing this degree and whether they're in a career that is unrelated or whether international relations has been their passion, uh, what would your advice be? And we'll close off from here. I would say study what you love. You know, any degree is going to feel like a drag if you're not really enjoying it. But if you really enjoy international relations, if you really enjoy, you know, shouting at the news or, you know, hurling your newspaper or whatever, whatever we read news on now, nowadays, down in, in fits of rage, this is a great degree for you. This is, this is how you understand the structural and historical, political, economic, social drivers behind what's happening in the world now. If you want to understand the ways in which history is impinging upon the present and 
the, the theoretical, have the theoretical conceptual understanding for why that is the case, this is a great degree for you. I don't think, I think a lot of people don't come in knowing the precise career that they want. I certainly did not. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I absolutely did not. Um, but studying this opens you up to a whole new world. It makes travel, you know, travel just becomes fascinating because you get to go then and sort of live these things that you have studied. So it can be hard to choose a degree if you're trying to think, you know, this is the specific career that I want. If you don't know the specific career that you want, but you find this stuff interesting, I think that's a good enough reason. If you have the ability to do it, I think great. Perfect. And we will close it off here. Um, the, our email address is in the chat box if you have any more questions. And thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And we hope to see you soon. My pleasure. I hope to see some of you in person when this silly pandemic is over. <laughs>